been a crazy couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, I really think that God is, uh, in this day of it, day and age, He's bringing restoration. Yes. Yeah. A little bit too much right now. So He's bringing restoration. And in the dictionary, it says that resurrection Restoration is an action of returning something to the former owner or place or condition. It's the return of a hereditary monarch to a throne or a head of state or to a government or to a regime or to full power. i got to tell you that God is doing stuff despite what everybody else is doing. Not in spite, but he's doing it because he's God and he's moving things faster than we've ever seen. He's doing things like we've never seen. You just you just look at what is going on. Uh, anybody that's on social media at all, and it doesn't even matter which kind of social media you're on, everybody's talking about Cayenne West. Kanye. Kanye. <laughs> they, they just start continually talking about it, and you know he just had this he, he just had this service in Baton Rouge this weekend, and there was several thousand people that came and that accepted the Lord. And then there's all kinds of people saying, well. It was just fake, and it was just this, and it's just this, and he shouldn't be doing this, and all these Christians. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, and I posted on one of them because it was getting like hundreds of hits in just a few minutes. And I said, you can say whatever you want, but there were thousands of people there that you would have never spoken to, nor anybody in your church would have ever spoken to, and you can't judge what's going to happen with that, but he was able to share the gospel with people that would have never walked into a church door before, that are now staying there all day long for a conference to hear nothing more than Jesus Christ and that he's a king. You can say whatever you want, but somebody who just got saved that buys that huge building where the ball comes down and hangs a banner down it that just says Jesus is king and then to go against him for that? When is the last time you ever saw Jesus as king in the middle of New York Times Square? And we're not just talking minor, we're talking the whole entire building top to bottom. He just didn't do it part way. He gave it his all. See, I remember that God says he's going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. And all you have to do is look at politics. All you have to do is look at what's happening. All you have to do is look at, through this whole thing, how many movie stars and stuff are getting saved. And everybody's just pointing to everything they've done. You know what? But we can't be judgmental about people. God is going to use who God's going to use. And we need to rejoice because you know what? When the Gospels preach and people are exposed to the Gospel of Christ, God is the one that's going to come in and change them, not us. It's not about a class. It's not about a church. It's not about a doctrine. It's not about what we're doing. It's what God is doing. You know, we're supposed to be fishers of men, not the cleaners of fish. And we're also not the judge and jury. Amen. In Amos chapter 9, starting in verse 11. Amos is ending this great prophetic message that he's had. And right here at the very end. He's talking about the restoration of Israel. And I want you to remember that the church hasn't replaced Israel, but the church has been grafted in. And God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whatever God is doing out there in the world, whatever He's done, I want to tell you, He can do the same thing. And the reality is, most of the time, He does do the same thing. Even if it doesn't look exactly the same, 
the pretense and what actually happens is exactly the same. And here's what the prophet said. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is falling, and I will repair its breaches. And I will raise up its ruins, and I will rebuild it as it was in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And that all the nations who were called by my name declares the Lord who does this. You see, God's going to take the ruins and he's going to rebuild them and he's going to use greatness. He's going to take the things that the enemy has meant for evil and he's going to turn around and use it for good. He's going to take the riches of the wicked and he's going to use it to do what he wants to do to bring his kingdom here. You know what? He's a God of restoration. And when we really understand restoration, restoration is where he takes the old us, he takes the old me, and he renews it into something great. And out of that renewal, the king is glorified. And it's not about what we've done, it's about who we've become. And it's not about that we've done it, it's because Christ has done it in us, to us, and now he's going to do it through us. Why? Because people can look at us and say, look at that person. My aunt and my uncle prayed for me for five years. They sent me every tape, every book, every little thing they could. And nothing made a difference. The day I actually finally really came to church, they had already given up on me because I told them a hundred times before I was going to come. And they gave up on me. And so when I got in church, all of them had given up and... Some of them had already left because there was three morning services. Some of them had already left. My aunt went and worked in the nursery because somebody didn't show up. And so when I showed up at church, the actual people that had been praying for me all that time weren't even there. <laughs> and so then I show up at a place where I didn't know anybody. And to be honest, I had really long hair. And it was an upper middle class church and everybody was wearing a three piece suit. One of the ushers at the door gave me some great advice. He said that I'd have to cut my hair if I was going to go to heaven. <laughs> no lie. And you know what? After I got saved, I worked at the church. And for the next two years, every day when he saw me, he told me I had to cut my hair if I was going to go to heaven. Some of the elders told me I had to cut my hair if I was going to go to heaven. All the time. But you know what the reality was? Is that morning, the pastor shared his testimony and God totally wrecked me. And I went from a wretched sinner to somebody that everybody around me didn't know. Instantaneously. And see, God wasn't holding what I'd done against me. God had done something new. He had brought restoration to my life. And through that restoration, who got the glory? I didn't get the glory because I didn't do anything. He got the glory because he was the only one that could do it. See, I think we really need to keep this whole thing in mind because years later now, we were at a conference, at a, uh, not a conference, at a fundraising deal for the people we go to in Thailand, here in Denver, and there's a couple there that were the missions pastors at the church that we got saved out of, and they were friends with my aunt and uncle, and so they got to meet me a lot of times before I was saved, so they knew the BC Steve. <laughs> and we were sitting across the table, and everybody was talking about different things we'd done in Thailand, and they looked across the table, and she goes... We never thought you were going to get saved, but when you did, we never thought you were going to amount to anything. We never had any aspirations past salvation, because that was already going to be a big enough hurdle. And I was thinking to myself, here we are, at that time, 28 years after I got saved, and they were still thinking the same thing for 28 years. I gotta tell you, if we're gonna pray for people for years, if we're gonna share the gospel with people, and we don't have any hope or we don't have any fault.
foresight. You know what? If God can save us out of that, He can use us to do anything. If God can save Kanye out of what he was in and make him take an album that he'd already recorded and redo the whole entire thing all to Christian and turn around and release it. It's absolutely crazy. And you know what? He can get away with things that none of us can get away with. The other video I saw this morning was when he's flying to Baton Rouge he had some of the choir with him on the plane. They're all sitting in economy. He wasn't sitting in first class. And you know what? They all started singing, and the whole entire plane was singing gospel songs. People were standing up in the aisle dancing, and they were trying to get him to sit down. But the whole entire thing, somebody was filming it from the front, the whole back of the plane was singing gospel songs with Kanye West on his way to Baton Rouge to share the gospel with fans that were following him a few months back when he didn't even know who Jesus was. We've got to guard our words and we've got to believe the best. When God is saving people out of something, he's also saving us into something. And if we're going to really believe that he is the king, we, we need to believe in the restoration. See, God's going to repair the breaches. He's going to restore the ruins. This whole thing with, with Catch the Fire partnering with us, this whole thing, I don't think, I don't even really understand the full depth of the ramifications of what God is doing. But you know what? God has a plan for Boulder, Colorado. Yes. And what the enemy is meant for evil, I mean, I don't know if people really understand, and maybe some of you do, but Boulder, Colorado is, you know, it's, it's worse than even like Salem. <laughs> it is. Every major cult has some kind of a training center in Boulder, Colorado. I bet you most of the people don't even know, but there's an Anton LaVey Satanic Priest Training Center in Boulder Canyon. When we were driving up one day through Seven Hills, there's a whole compound up there that's just dedicated to worshiping Hindu gods, where people have sold everything and they're just living there and 24-7 worshiping the multitude of Hindu gods on the whole side of the mountain. I don't know, a lot of people here maybe don't know. I remember when I was a little kid, the Krishnas that had the little ponytail out the side and were selling the poppies everywhere. The Krishnas still have a major training center right in Boulder, Colorado. They're not all dressing that way now, but it's still the same foundation. It's still the same teachings. It's still the same thing they're following. And you know what? I really believe God is saying no more. You know, God is taking back the land little by little by little by little. And the great part is, we get to be a key part of that. And our part is, just listening to Him and rebuilding the ruins. He's going to rebuild the ruins, we just need to listen to Him. You know what, when people get saved, when He touches people, we need to be there not to see that we correct all their mistakes, we need to be there to disciple them. And discipling is not about pointing out all your faults. Discipling is seeing people as God sees them. I mean, everybody saw Paul for who he was. He was a religious zealot. He was out killing people for what he believed was absolutely right. Right? That's what he was doing. But God saw him as a great apostle that was going to write most of the New Testament. And when everybody else was cursing Paul and running away from Paul, 
God took time to meet with Paul. And I want you to think about when, when God met with Paul, what happened? He went blind, but just think what was happening down the road. The people in the, in the town where he was going, they were all praying. And so how would you like to say, all right, God, I'm not going to run like everybody else in town did. I'm not going to run because I trust you. You're going to take care of this situation. And you're praying, and you're just sitting there, and 90% of the people have left because they're running for their lives because Paul's not messing around. I mean, there's definitely a history. Everybody knows what's going to happen when Paul comes to town and you're a Christian. Just think about sitting there praying, and all of a sudden the report comes in. God showed up and he knocked Paul off his horse and made him blind. We'd be saying, God, you answered my prayers. Right? I mean, we would be doing the hallelujah dance even if you don't dance. We'd be jumping up and down. We'd go Pentecostal, start swinging from the chandeliers. Because we'd be so excited because here's somebody that we knew was coming to kill us and our families and God took care of the situation. Right? And then while you're, while, while you're rejoicing, while you're getting so happy, God goes, and I'm bringing him to you, and when he comes, I want you to pray for him and restore his eyesight. Right. Hold it, God. I, I was all for the knocking him off his horse. I, I'm way for the blinding. I would have preferred death. <laughs> you know, the lightning bolt or... A lion may be coming out after he fell off. You know, there's a lot of other things I would have wanted. I mean, I'm just being honest. That's the way we think. He has to pay for what he did. But see, when God built up their faith, they said, now I'm going to take you to a whole other level of faith. You prayed and I answered your prayer, but you don't know what you prayed for. You don't know how this fits, how this little puzzle piece fits in this big, huge scheme of things that's about ready to happen. Right. And it's not about Paul, it's about me. It's not about what Paul is doing, it's about my kingdom being manifest right here on earth. And you can see right there at that point in time, when you read through the book of Acts, you can see that some of the Christians were already becoming critical and pointing their fingers at all the other people saying you're not good enough and that's the very thing they were complaining about about the Jews. Yeah. And so in a very, very, very small period of time they went from being persecuted by the Jews to persecuting the Jews and they were saying you can't be right and the next thing they were saying but you're totally wrong. How many times do we do the same thing? See, God is rebuilding the ruins. He's going to raise it up like in the days of old. You know what? He's bringing restoration. And in that restoration, it's God's ideal to change everything. You know, God gives us a little glimpse. Some of you maybe know, some of you maybe don't know, but there's some major principality-type strongholds in Boulder. And God started revealing that. And one of those strongholds is has to do with the Old Testament gods of Baal and Asher. And after God showed us some things, He said, I'll reveal to you who they are. And so, I don't know if you know, but Baal and Asher in the scripture, their number one thing was the sacrifice of babies. That was the number one thing. If you were going to serve them, that was a non-negotiable. It was an ongoing, it had to be done, not just once a year, it had to be done all the time. Well, you know where that principality sits? 
He sits right over Warren Hearn's office, the abortion clinic in Boulder, Colorado, which was the very first abortion clinic to open after Roe v. Wade was passed. The very first one in the United States. The very first one to do late-term abortions. He wrote all the books, all the journals on doing it. There's very few people actually in the United States that will do abortions up to the day before the baby's born. And he wrote all the books on it. I think there's only four people that will do it one day before. And two of them are ladies that live in California, and one flies to New Mexico where her thing is on her private plane, and the other one I think is in Utah, and they don't even live where they're at because of the persecution. But Warren has this compound that he's owned since the very beginning. It's right across the street from Boulder Community Hospital. Well, after God revealed that to us, you go, okay, what do you do about that? I mean, we pray, but people have been praying for years. People have been praying since the day it was passed outside his place. Since that very first open, within that first week, people were already praying against him. He's still in business, and he's still training people all over the world. A few months after that happened, there's only two doctors in that place that do this. One of them got saved a year ago, December. He walked into church, God touched him, he came up during worship and he told the pastor, he told the person that was on the prayer team that came up to pray for him, this is who I am, this is what I've done, and he just broke down and he accepted the Lord. So I heard this testimony and I was so excited because God said that he's going to do something. He is going to rebuild the ruins. He is going to restore the kingdom. He is going to do this. That's something that nobody could have done. And one month later, we're having a conference here, and somebody shares a testimony that God had given her a prophetic word years before that God was going to start reaching out and changing abortion doctors. And I see this man get out of his chair, and he runs forward, and he falls right here on the floor, and he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's wrecked. And come to find out, it's that same doctor. I met with that doctor for many hours on several different days in the upper room. He told me that when you work in an abortion clinic, that it is absolutely horrendous, the spiritual warfare. He said it's demonic. Not even a Christian, he knew it was demonic. But this is the other part he said. He said that everybody there, whether it's the janitor, whether it's a secretary, whether it's the repair people that come and work on their building, that people who identify them go after them, go after their children, show up in the grocery store, show up at events, and they totally demonize them. And he goes, you know what? <clears throat> no matter how bad the demonic attack is, I would rather deal with the demons real than deal with the demonic that Christians bring on my family. No comparison. There was absolutely no way that anybody in his office wanted anything to do with Jesus because of the way Christians treat him. And my heart broke. And I mean, this man is sitting there before me, quivering, blubbering, can't even hardly breathe. Totally, 100% distraught after doing abortions for almost 50 years. You know what? If we can't love people that get saved, if we can't love people into the kingdom, it's not us to judge, to judge them. But i got to tell you is, if we start getting abortion doctors saved instead of going after them and their families, you know what? There's going to be nobody to do abortions. If you get child predators saved, then you don't have to do rescues anymore. Yes. If you get the pimp saved, 
then there's nobody for him to pimp. Amen. If you get the drug dealers saved, there's no drugs to be out there. So we're always worried about the fruit that's falling on the ground or the fruit we see, and we're not worried about rebuilding the ruins. We're trying to do everything God wants to do. That's God's job, and we want God to do everything that we're supposed to be doing. You know what? God isn't going to bring people through the door. He can, but I mean, he's not going to bring people through the door. He's going to bring us to people. And we're going to bring those people through the door. We're going to take those people and we're going to introduce them to the king. And then we're going to train them and we're going to love them into the kingdom. And we're going to let God clean them up as he sees fit. I love listening to Andrew Walmack and he was talking about a long time ago at his church, there was a lady that got saved. She was a prostitute on the street in Colorado Springs. And she got saved, and she had been doing this for a long time. Like probably, I think it was greater than 15 or 20 years. That's the only thing she knew since she was a little girl. <coughs> and she, she would show up at church every week. She would show up for women's Bible study. She would show up for midweek service. She would show up for evening service. And guess what? She would wear the best clothes she had. Short shorts, high boots crop tops, open belly. She always wore the best she had. And the ladies from the ladies' ministry came and met with him and they said, this can't happen anymore. And he goes, she's wearing the best she has. Why do you want to change her when God brought her in? Why do you want to tell her she can't come if that's the way she's dressing? He goes, you need to find out what God is saying. And they ended up taking her shopping and they bought her a whole new wardrobe. All the ladies got together and they took her shopping. It isn't that that's what she wanted to wear, but you know what? That's all she had. And to be honest, when she got saved, she lost her job. And she lost her house. And she lost everything she had. And then it even gets better because like a month and a half later... He asked if anybody had a testimony on a Sunday morning. And nobody stood up. And she stood up. She hadn't been saved that long. So she stood up wearing her new clothes. And everybody was happy about that. I'm just telling you. And then Andrew Walmack says she stands up. Effing God is so effing good because he effing saved me off the street. And people were absolutely... And he goes, at least she has a testimony. At least she's doing something. At least she's thankful for what God has done. And you want to change your language, but you don't even have a testimony because you're just coming and you're marking a place and you're just sitting in a seat. But God is working on her and God is changing her and she's rejoicing in the only way she knows how to rejoice. See, we want to change everybody, but God wants us to love them where they're at. Why? Because he loved us where we're at. Didn't he? Is there any one of us that he told, when you get cleaned up, when you dress right, when you clean up your mouth, when you stop drinking, when you stop cussing, when you start treating your wife and children right, when you're the perfect husband, when you're the perfect wife, when you're doing everything right, when you've made restoration to all the people you hurt, then you can come to church. John Kyle is the only one God told that to. <laughs> and I'm sorry, John, you missed the boat. In verse 12, he says, They will possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and treader of grapes him who sows the seed. And the mountain shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them in their land and they will never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord. You hear what he says? The plowman is going to overtake the reaper. 
You know what? When I was reading that scripture, I was thinking about all these people that had gotten saved that everybody's so upset about. You know what? They're out saving thousands of people. So the plowman is definitely overtaking the reaper. I mean, they're already reaping what hasn't even been sown yet, and people are complaining about the crop that's coming in. Planting and harvesting in one motion, one sweep. They sweep the sickle, and it plants the seed and cuts it down at the same exact time. The church I got saved at? Before I got saved, one of my last jobs out of the hundreds of different kinds of jobs I had is I worked for a concert company. And we did any kind of concert. We did country, we did heavy metal, we did orchestras, we did everything. And so when I got saved, a couple things happened. One was, I got a job at the church because I could no longer do my job anymore. There was just too much of everything there. I couldn't, I had to change my playgrounds or my playmates if I was going to make it. And God knew that. So I got a job at a church that I got saved at, and I was a maintenance man, and I worked swing shift. So that meant I was there every single night. It also meant that I had to attend church every single Sunday, regardless, because that was one of the requirements. So I had to attend a service in the morning, and then I had to stay there all day, and I was the only one there all day long. I had to clean up everything, set up for everything for the evening service. See, God knew what I needed. Because I couldn't just say I'm going to stay home and watch the Bronco game because everybody else was watching the Bronco game and I was there setting up for evening service. See, God knew what it was going to take to keep somebody like me engaged. But through that, I met the people at the church that were really doing things for the kingdom. And you know what? I hadn't been saved. I'd never been in church. I didn't know anything about those things. But I'll tell you, when I was at church, I would see the people that their kids and their grandkids were blessed. <laughs> and I started noticing that there was people doing a whole lot of work in the church and their kids were tearing up everything I was trying to fix. They were outside spinning donuts in the parking lot. They were smoking dope. They were drinking beer. They were kicking holes in the wall. But these parents were leaders. But I also saw some that because the parents were doing things, the children were absolutely blessed. Their grandkids were blessed. And just out of natural, those are the people I gravitated towards. And those are the people that instantly started pouring into my life. And through that, I didn't have to walk a long path because everybody poured into my life was a general in the kingdom. Everybody poured into my life knew the king. And every Friday night, they would do an intercessory prayer group. And there was three men. And I used to like to open up the room for them and go in the little prayer chapel they had upstairs. Why? It's because any one of the three of them, you would just stand there in the room with them. And the very second they uttered the words, God. God would rush in the room and all the hair on my body would stand up on end. And I was like, this is a better rush than any drugs I've ever done. I used to look forward to them coming every week. And so relating to what's going on right now, one day I was in there and there was this little lady, Deanie Bodette, that was there all the time. And she just started praying for me. And she started prophesying over me, and I didn't really know 100% what was going on. But I knew that all the hair on my body was standing up. I knew that God had entered the room. I knew that it was overwhelming. I knew that it was hard to stand. And she said, well, God's going to use you in a very great way. And so I, I remember I spoke out. I'm excited about that, you know. Something like that. And she goes, it's going to be so big, it's bigger than you can imagine. Well, I worked at a concert company, and I was thinking, I could imagine going to Red Rocks and doing praise and worship for several nights, because back in 88, people weren't doing it like they are now. And she goes, no, bigger than you can imagine. 
And I go, I could imagine filling Bronco Stadium. She goes, no, bigger than you can imagine. And I go, well, I don't know if I have anything bigger than that. And then I realized at that moment that I'd only answered the lady verbally once. I hadn't said another word. And what I was thinking, God was speaking to her and she was answering my responses <laughs> verbally and I hadn't even spoken a word. When we were just in the Dominican Republic, somebody walked up to me and said, God is going to do something bigger than you've ever dreamed or imagined. And it's right around the corner. I still don't know what that is, but God is saying, don't forget the former words I told you 30 years ago because I just don't say things to say things. None of us here can forget the former words God has said over you. not change God's words. People that maybe were involved could turn around and walk away. We have a choice to walk away from God anytime we want. We have free will. Some people have been praying for their marriages to be restored. You know what? People have a free will to walk away and not hear from God or not follow what God is saying. It doesn't mean God's will for you has changed. And I'm talking about the personal thing and I'm saying don't give up on that. My aunt and uncle prayed for me for five years. Don't, don't give up on that. But also, don't let that be the bar for what God has told He's going to do with you to stop you from going forward in what God has. I fully believe that God is going to bring restoration to Boulder just like He did to Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs used to be a vile place and now there's major worldwide ministries there that are impacting and advancing the kingdom in greater ways than places all over the earth. I don't think it's by happenstance, even reading the scripture, where God says that he's going to, in verse 14, I'm going to restore the fortunes of my people. And he, there, Amos is talking to Israel, but you know what? He's going to restore the fortunes of his people. And you know what? If we're faithful with the little, God is always going to give us more. And as God gives us more, what does he say? Those people that are faithful are going to happen? It says they're going to rebuild the ruined cities. And not only rebuild them, they're going to inhabit them. And they're going to build gardens, and they're going to build vineyards, and they're going to build schools, and they're going to build counseling centers, and they're going to build places that you're going to see restoration come to the people of that city. Yeah. I'm going to get together, but there are all kinds of prophetic words about Boulder, Colorado that have happened since the 70s and the Jesus movement all the way till now. But there's people that have never even been to Boulder that said that there's going to come a time when God is going to so radically change Boulder, it's going to go from like a Sodom and Gomorrah, and when God comes in and moves in, that it's going to so radically change that people from all over the world are going to come because they're going to say, I can believe this can happen some places, but not in Boulder, Colorado. And the crazy part about that is, I would say the majority of these words were given before I was even saved. And now here I am, I find myself, we never wanted to have a church in Boulder and God gave us this whole property. I wasn't looking for a property, I would have never bought a property in Boulder County in a million years. I wouldn't even have looked. They could have said it was $25 and I probably wouldn't have came because I would have said to myself, there's a scam. But God has a whole other plan. He says, you know what? I can put you where I want to put you. And I have a way to get you there. And when you're there, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And then you're going to see I'm going to do it. And so when God does something like that, when God says, I'm going to give you the building next week, and next week the pastor calls and says, the building's yours. You're like, okay, now you really got my attention. And it 
hasn't all been easy, but it's all been great. It hasn't all been smooth, but in that, it's like sliding down sandpaper. All the rough edges come right off. <laughs> it can be uncomfortable, but at the end, when it's baby smooth, it makes a huge difference. The process isn't always great, but as we do it, you know what? God wants to use business people to give them fortunes so that they can rebuild the cities around them. So that they can make an impact. I mean, it's true. People are saying, the, the number one thing when I was saved, when people got saved and people really started being used by God, they'd tell them, well, you have to quit your job and come on staff at the church. There was a man at a church in California we knew. They set him down and said, hey, God's really called you to full-time ministry because God was using him mightily. And they said, we want you to come on eldership, full-time staff. But you have to do it. And here's a window. And it was a window of like less than a month where he had to make the decision. He was only less than a year from full retirement at the corporation he worked for. And he quit. And he went to work for the church. And very shortly after that, he died. And his wife and kids were left for nothing. I mean, the church still supported him. But it wasn't the same as his corporate job where God was continually blessing him. We can't force people to do what we think is best. We need to be listening to God. And you know what? God used business people. If you really look at it, Paul was a business person. He said, I came and I wasn't a burden to you. And he was a tent maker for all the years. He was there helping the church, planning the church, growing the church. I think we need to take all these concepts we have and we just need to throw them out the window. We say, God, what do you have for me? And don't add to it and don't take away from it. Just say, God, what do you have for me? There's some people in here that God wants you to quit your job and go to a lower paying job. Why? Because he has something there for you. He has people there that you're going to reach and he's going to, when he tells you that, I'm going to tell you, he's going to make a way. Every time God's told us to do something crazy, God's made a way. He did that to in our life early on. We were youth pastors at a church, and the church gave us zero, zero financial support whatsoever. And the youth group started going. And we did a homeless ministry. We had all these buses, but we couldn't have a bus. But yet, all the kids that were coming, their parents were coming. And so we were just making it. Like, I was working full time, but we were just making it. Paycheck to paycheck. I know nobody hears like that, but. And God said, go out and buy a 15 passenger van. So what do you do when God says to do that? You go look at every beat up, final seat, pole, 350,000 mile. 15 passenger van that's been used as a ski van that rides like this. And we did that. And everyone we looked at, God said, no, no, no. And then there was a man at church that worked for one of the major car dealerships. And we went and bought a brand new Dodge with a surround sound stereo system in it. It was really nice. It had been used for a very short period of time. And then the company went out of business, so they ended up with it. And he gave us a great deal on it, but it was still a huge payment. And you're buying a 15-passenger van. So we sold our other car, and that was our family car. It was a big block 15-passenger Dodge van. And with that, our youth group grew from 15 to like 35, and we used to cram everybody in there. We paid for every outreach. We paid for everything we did. 
And I look back at that time, and you look back at your tax statement, and you look back at your W-2s, and you go, here's what we were paying for gas, here's what we were paying for water, here's what we were paying for food, here's what we were paying for the church to get all these kids to all these things and from all these things. And here's what we were paying on a car payment and insurance. And you know what? If you put it in a balance sheet, they're not even close. And at that point in time, I never realized how miraculous it was because I'm going to tell you, we never missed a payment, but yet we were never behind. There was always food in the refrigerator. The gas was always on. We never had to go bank people for money. Why? Because we were right in the center of God's will. And at that time, I was so young in my faith, I didn't realize the miraculous things. I wasn't keeping tally. So you could go back and go, wow. This money came up in my bank account, or this money showed up in our wallet. I don't know how it all happened, but you know what? Through that whole several years of our life, we never went without one thing. And why? It's because we weren't counting on anything. We were just listening to what God was saying, and we were so wrapped up with what God was saying and what God was doing that we just didn't realize what he was really doing over here. We were doing what he told us to do, and he was providing for what he told us to do. Huh? All right, it's been the last 32 years. You know, the whole earth belongs to, God, belongs to God. And the other part of that scripture is the fullness. Not only does the whole earth belong to him, but the fullness of everything that's in it. I think Christians as a whole, I think we need to stop looking at Focusing on all the minute details of politics and what's going on here and what this church is doing, what these people believe. We spend all this time attacking each other. We spend all this time instead of just doing what God's told us to do. And don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying walk away from politics, but I'm telling you, you know what? Politics aren't going to save the world. Yes, we need to be responsible. Yes, we need to vote. I'm not going to tell anybody how to vote or what party or any of those things. But you know what? God's going to use who God's going to use. And we need to be hearing what God is saying. And it doesn't matter what the letter before, before their party is. What matters is what God is saying. We have a president now that nobody said was going to be a president, but now he is. Mexico has a president now that nobody said was going to be a president, but now he is. I honestly believe in one key thing. God says, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who curse Israel. And I really believe that one of the key things is, is God knew Trump's heart, and he said he will do what every other politician has said they were going to do and didn't do. And he'll restore Jerusalem as the capital that God said it was going to be in Israel. And you know what? God used a lot of wicked people in the Bible to do great things for him. And a lot of them he changed their heart and some of them he didn't. But you know what? It was the right choice at the right time and God is the one that's making it. God puts in rulers and God removes rulers. We need to be hearing from God, and so I'm not saying you just walk away from politics, but what's more important is that we need to be hearing what God is saying for us individually, right now, in this season. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to build our own kingdom? Are we trying to provide for our own family? Are we trying to do what God's called us to do and follow after what He's called us to do? We can focus on the things right in front of us, but i got to tell you, God's perspective is so much greater. We need 
to have that big perspective. So I just want to I want you just to close your eyes where you're at and I want you just to think about things that God has said over you even when you first got saved things that God has said over you things that God has spoken to you either through prophetic words or through his word as you read it or, or through times of worship or, or through dreams or visions or whatever it may be things that God has said to you that are specifically about you and nobody else And as you're thinking about that, you just need to be honest with yourself. And I want you to ask, I want to ask you the question is, have you given up on that or have you put that on the back burner for whatever reasons? That's for later on. That's for after the kids are gone. That's for when I already own my house. That's for after I retire. That's for whatever. I want to let you know that God hasn't put stuff off. We just haven't walked into what He's given us. God has given us the promised land, just like He gave the children of Israel. But we can choose to wander in the desert and keep going around the mountain and never step into it. But I really think that today is like a defining day for a lot of people in this room. And God is saying, today is the day. And when it comes around, I no longer want you to go around the mountain. I want you to go in and cross over the Jordan that I've laid before you. And so, if God's speaking to you now, I just want you to be bold and just throw down the gauntlet, and I just want you to come up. And just coming up and just saying, God, I'm no longer going to stay where I'm at. I want to walk into the fullness that you have for me. God, I'm going to believe the promises that you've spoken over me. I'm going to believe the words you've spoken. And even though I can't fathom how it's going to happen, I know you're going to touch me today. I, I just want to be released into the fullness of your will. I no longer want to be held back. I no longer want to be held back by myself or my own understanding. God has generals all over this room, and you know what? Just like he spoke to me, I guarantee you lots of things he's spoken over you are bigger than you could ever dream or imagine. And if it's bigger than you can dream or imagine, you've got to know that it's God. God has spoken those things because it's Him. If you need breakthrough in your life, in your family, if there's things you've been praying for for years and you want to see breakthrough, I just want you to come forward. If you know there's things in your life that not people are throwing on you, but there's things in your life that you know that God wants to remove, I just want you to come forward. If there's situations you're struggling with, I just want you to come forward. This is a, this is a divine moment. This is an encounter time with the living God where he wants to tangibly manifest his presence your life right now.
spoken over each and every one of these people standing here. Lord, we just cancel every demonic assignment in their life. Lord, I just come against anything, Lord, that is hindering them. Lord, I break down right now. Lord, break down those things that have kept them from walking in the fullness of what you said. Lord, may they walk in the fullness. Lord, may they not have to be knocked off their horse and gone blind, Lord. May they not have religious ideas, but Lord, may they hear the pure, undefiled word that comes out of your word and from your throne. Lord, we just speak release into destiny. We speak release of the things that have held them back. And Lord, we just thank you for the fullness in their life. I am my own understanding.